but the recording is going, so take it away. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Actually, when we do the recorded um, <clears throat> Zoom conversations on campus when I'm teaching, there's an obligatory warning message that pops up saying that this meeting is being recorded. I see that <laughs> we don't. We don't have that just so that all of a sudden people know they need to start behaving themselves. Um, first of all, thanks very much to everyone for coming. This is the first meeting of the Media and Entertainment Special Interest Group. Uh, we did have a meetup that I'll sketch for everybody uh, what maybe is already a week and a half, two weeks ago even, um, which was tangentially related to this, but not having been at the meetup is, is of no consequence. Um, as David, the other David, David B, uh, just mentioned, this is a pretty small group today, so maybe we should just all go around and introduce ourselves very quickly, because I imagine that um, there are some instances in which people are not already acquainted with one another. My name is David McFadgen. I'm faculty at UCLA. I teach in comparative literature and musicology and digital humanities. Uh, so my interest in blockchain and the interest in creating this group came specifically from that from creating tools that will help to combat some uh, persistent issues vis-a-vis -vis piracy. Maybe I should call out people's names um, lest we interrupt one another. So as far as my screen is arranged, uh, John, you would be next. All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is John Bauer. Uh, I've met both the Davids before, so hello to both of you. Uh, and thanks for the invite here. Um, I was not at the meetup, uh, but this is my first time uh, joining. Uh, I currently work at Pandora, where uh, the music streaming service, not the jewelry company. Sometimes I have to preface that. <clears throat> uh, and uh, have had an interest in blockchain for a while now, specifically in um, uh, what can be done in the music industry for uh, with, with, a, with a ledger, with a shared ledger. Uh, we've run some experiments uh, at Pandora. It's been a while now, haven't come back to it uh, in a minute, um, but uh, still very much interested in what's possible and excited for the evolution of the entire technology and uh, wanna keep up with it in case uh, the evolution and uh, my or our needs at the company intersect. So uh, I would love to follow along and uh, looking forward to meeting all of you, thanks. Right. Brett, are you there? No, the moment I mentioned his name, he dropped out. Sebastian. Hello, good evening, everyone. I'm calling in from the Netherlands, and it's my second time uh, I'm uh, uh, able to attend this group. Um, I'm the chairman of the ICC Foundation, um, which um, uh, um, has been developing over the last four years the content uh, or asset identifier ICC, which we might be talking about um, uh, in this uh, call as well. Um, and I'm working on a s new startup um, called Lysium, uh, which uh, uses content certificates for trusted uh, digital content licensing. Heidi, would you like to say a word? Certainly. Hello, David. Hello, everybody. My name is Heidi Peace. I'm calling in right now from the desert, um, about two hours north of the Grand Canyon. So my apologies for not having the bandwidth for visual. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be here. David, thank you so much for inviting me. I feel very honored to be in this group. Uh, I am the I guess the original co-founder of blockchain at UCLA with David and then left UCLA and founded a group called the Los Angeles Blockchain Lab, which has been collaborating on projects with different centers at UCLA, University of Southern California, University of California, Irvine, as well as with Los Angeles City, Los Angeles County. And we worked on projects for Panasonic, Lamborghini, um, and we pretty much collaborate with uh, the leading businesses in Southern California, government officials and academics. And we also have a 
a, an impact facing initiative, which is focused on helping women and disadvantaged youth have more accessibility to blockchain. Um, and then I have on the side also my startup, which is POA. We are helping artists, influencers, um, amateur athletes, entertainers of all sorts to fundraise using token, token economics and as well uh, NFTs. So I really look forward to whatever project we end up working on in this group. And uh, thank you again for having me. Thanks very much. Uh, Sergio. Uh, I'm Sergio and I'm a software engineer for Arena World. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm new like to the blockchain space and I just want to like learn more about it. Would you care to say anything more? Uh, no, not really. Okay, that's good. Uh, Greg, would you care to say a word? Uh, sorry, David, was that one to me? Uh, please, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Uh, let's see if I can get on video here. Uh, morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Scarry. Um, I've for a few years been involved in the uh, the blockchain space, working uh, with a company called El Toros as a uh, solutions architect. Um, we've done a number of pilots and implementations um, in predominantly in Hyperledger uh, stacks, mostly Fabric. Um, and I've helped uh, off and on to help coordinate the Hybrid Ledger Los Angeles um, meetup group. Um, so just here to, uh, I've always had interest uh, in, in music uh, and the, uh, the artistic content uh, realm. So I'm um, just hoping to uh, help in that capacity, uh, however I can. Thanks. That sounds great. Uh, Brett, you, you've come back online. Would you like to say a word? Yes, I'm here. I'll uh, do my video. Good morning, all. I'm up in Canada here. It's freezing, and uh, I'm uh, uh, embarking on a journey uh, since 2018 on uh, building out something on uh, uh, fabric that uh, would be an all-inclusive um, uh, participation by everyone within a a production, a film production, uh, from a cameraman all the way up to uh, actors, actresses, et cetera, that uh, would, uh, through uh, tokenomics, uh, participate in the funding and the profitability of, uh, of, a, of a production. But uh, uh, in essence, bringing all contracts uh, onto a chain, uh, every aspect of accounting, every, uh, every, uh, 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 every moving part of a production uh, and uh, all the participants in a production Onto a uh, onto a blockchain. That's my uh, my uh, my goal. I've been involved uh, with uh, blockchain type uh, products uh, since Bitcoin in the in 2012. So it's exciting stuff, and I'm happy to be here with all of you folks. That's great. Whereabouts in Canada? I'm just north of Toronto in the ski territory oh, okay. that's opening up uh, in a week finally. Yeah, I just want my brother lives in Toronto. That's what I was asking. I'm just north of Toronto. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you for everything, David, by the way. Well, you're welcome. I mean, I've just opened the door. Well, you know, you guys outnumber me significantly. So let's wait and see what happens. And that's all uh, the David, by the way, David uh, Boswell as well. Thank you so much. I'm out. Yeah, happy to help. Thank uh, Matthews. Hi, I'm, I'm Matthews Thomas. I'm the lead architect at IBM's Telecom and Media Labs. Um, doing a lot of work with blockchain and telco. David Boswell is very familiar with it. And we've done quite a lot of work with uh, media also, uh, ad sales and a whole bunch of other areas. And uh, Aman is also, you know, both Aman and I are part of the same team. And Aman will be introducing himself, himself shortly also. Actually, just by coincidence, he's the, the last person to jump on. So yeah, Aman, would you just get to <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I can, I can go next then. So Aman, short for Amandeep Singh. Um, as Matthias mentioned, we both are part of the Telco Media Entertainment um, uh, Labs in IBM. And uh, I, I'm a specialist uh, uh, and an architect in this group. And 
we've been involved in uh, the telecom sig as well uh, with david and others and uh, happy to uh, contribute on the media front as well and also to learn about the exciting use cases use cases that everyone is working on fantastic that's everybody um, thank you very much um, the, 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 the need for these introductions will hopefully lessen each time. So what I want to do is try and rattle through the, the, the official aspects of the meeting very quickly because they're the, the least interesting. Uh, so just to pass over these bullet points, we did have a meetup, the date of which I can't remember, but something like a week or two weeks ago, uh, where if you look in the chat, you'll see in an open conversation, um, the three topics that tended to float to the surface just as a, a general intro to some of the things that people in this group thus far have been interested in. One was um, remuneration. So you can see the particular URLs that were proposed in the chat. Two was NFT specifically regarding WAX. So there again, you can see some references to look at, it at your leisure. And then also uh, asset IDs as well. So we don't need to stick to those now, and in fact we won't, but those are thus far the initial topics of interest. Uh, second thing I have listed here, proposal regarding minutes. Um, I'm not a fan of bureaucracy at all. Uh, I have a pronounced dislike for it. So you will probably know that one of the wonderful things that Zoom does is that it uh, allows us to save the chat as a text document so what I'm inclined to do is the same as I did here with the meetup is instead of official minutes, I'll send everybody two things. One will be um, the actual full chat conversation later on as a text file again, but also I'll cherry pick it. So as and when topics come up, but maybe they're not referenced with URLs or clickable links and so on, I'll send those to people separately. So there's an opportunity to ignore what's in the chat if you don't have time to check it in real time. David, one, uh, real, one real quick observation about chat. When you're talking about chat, you're not talking about the Zoom chat, I think, but the permanent group chat, correct? Mm. Sorry, yeah, I misspoke. Absolutely, yeah. So just so, yeah, uh, people are aware, I dropped the link to that, uh, the media entertainment SIG group chat on Hyperledger's chat server uh, in the Zoom chat here, if people want to go over to there. And that's nice because it's permanent, doesn't go away when the Zoom meetings are over. Uh, next up is, oh, geographical dispersion. Um, uh, just having done thus far among the members of the group, a quick survey of who lives where. We were fairly evenly distributed across four major regions. One would be west coast of the States, the other one would be east coast, then continental Europe, and then Asia, by which I mean Southeast Asia. So we have one person thus far in Africa, but nonetheless, given those uh, divisions, it makes sense to have two meetup times. So what we'll be doing is doing as much as we can offline and meeting uh, once a month for each of two groups. So one will be this time, which is useful to people arguably on both sides of the States and Europe, but for our Asian colleagues, not so, in fact, not, not at all. Most of them are probably still asleep. So we'll have a meeting uh, every third week, if you like, in the month or every third week in each month in order to accommodate them. And that'll be meeting, as far as I'm concerned, in the evenings as opposed to the morning. So at least that way, once a month, everybody gets to um, see as many of their colleagues as they can. Um, there's one or two things we have left to do in order to become official uh, Hyperledger group, which I'm sure David will pick me up on if I'm not quite right. But one is to do an introduction video. One is to do a blog post, which will just be a brief summary of what we're, we're interested in as a group. Would that be correct, David? A blog post for sure. I mean, as far as the video, that's more optional. We do have the video, to your point, we did do the meetup and we have a video recording of that. I mean, I think it's helpful to have video content about the group. It's your choice. Do we want to point people to that recording or do you want to make a short new recording about, about what the group is doing? But yeah, a blog post. Sure, I can do that. I can do that with, with my dog sitting in front of the fire or something. You know, that's just... great. So we can embed that. <laughs> right. I'll have a large snifter and a cigar. And, you know, <laughs> That'd be very sophisticated. Just complain about it. Right, exactly. <laughs> I got a tweet jacket somewhere. That's awesome. Yeah, so whenever you do that, we'll uh, put it on the website and that will be the official launch. 
Absolutely. And if we do in, in agree on what, what it is we'd like to build together, something of mutual interest, then logically we would then apply to you guys to set up a Hyperledger lab with the GitHub page, correct? Well, that really speaks to, you know, my, maybe my role and I, maybe I didn't have a chance to introduce myself. So I'll do that really quick. So I'm a Hyperledger staff member. My role is basically to support the group with whatever you're doing. And there are other special interest groups in the community for example, around healthcare, telecom, a range of different uh, groups. And each group does a different set of things because I think the challenges to adoption in those industries are obviously specific to that industry. So some groups have done coding projects where they've created a, a repo in our labs a, a structure where they can collaborate together. Other groups have done other things. Other groups are more research-based. They've created, for example, white papers so if this group wants to do a coding project, yeah, we have, I mean, we're an open source coding community. We have infrastructure for that. So that, and that really speaks to, I'm here. I want to hear what the group is wanting to do. And then whatever it is that you want to do, I'm here to support with that. So, but yeah, if coding is something this group wants to do, we can certainly support. Well, in that light, actually, I've just put up on the chat uh, a link to uh, one of our Hyperledger pages thus far, where we are asked if we so wish, either in addition to something like a white paper or instead of something like a white paper, as David pointed out, a code-based project. So one of the things that I propose, and I would love input on this, I would love to know where it sounds interesting, where it sounds amateurish, where maybe you guys can come in with your uh, skill sets. The link I put up is to something that uses the media that I've got as just a, a test case. And my hope was that we could use it as fuel for a platform that would be of wide interest to a wide number of people. So just as a 20 second sketch, um, a lot of what I officially teach at UCLA is to do with Eastern Europe. So if you, you can imagine because of the work I've done there with musicians for a long time, um, piracy is a huge problem. So I've built up an enormous um, data set of audio files over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. And recently when I had digitized the whole thing from all kinds of formats, we're talking about something like 2 million files. And because I donated all the music to a museum in Los Angeles, I'm looking at basically the, the potential for two types of platform. One would be as Philippe, um, I forgot to ask Philippe to introduce himself, he will in a second. One uh, that Philippe says in his world is referred to as heritage media. So something that I call museum data sets. So that would be a public facing platform that would monitor, let's say the official borrowing and usage of archival material. And the other one is to do with musicians who are alive and kicking and maybe even working in an independent sphere, um, but basically people who are not being properly uh, recompensed for the ways in which their music is being employed by radio stations, by shopping malls, by fashion shows, by uh, airports, anybody who decides to actually use it. So if you take a look at that proposal when you have time, that'd be super. And let me know uh, if it sounds it's like something of interest. And secondly, where you think it could be improved, I would be much obliged. And if we reject it out of hand, that's also great. And we can go off and do something if you like more academic, like produce a theoretical white paper together. But I just wanted to get the ball rolling with a potential um, a workable data set. So that's that. We're getting very close to the end of the official stuff. Oh, there is a grant now available for one of us to mentor um, a uh, uh, logically an up and up and coming individual with whom we work. So in my case, that might be something like a student. Um, and David, do you want to quickly sketch that program? Because you say there's something like uh, maybe five or six thousand dollars available to uh, educate and enlighten somebody who is very much interested in gaining uh, new or improved sets with Hyperledger. Absolutely, yeah. So every year Hyperledger has been running a paid a mentorship program where uh, we do to, we connect parts of the project uh, that has, uh, you know, a project that they want some, a student to work on. So that could be one of the Hyperledger projects like Fabric, for example, Indy, or it could be one of these special interest groups, you know, any, any existing community member with a project that they think would be a good fit for a student and that they want to be a mentor for, we want to connect them with students who uh, are excited to get involved. You know, our goal is to obviously get more people familiar with Hyperledger, get more people familiar with, you know, contributing to open source that fits with the Linux Foundation's mission. So we do have a budget each year to run these projects. We're, we're at the process right now where we're inviting 
the existing community members to draft up some project ideas. That's the first step in the project. Then we have a committee that reviews those and picks those, and then those become the projects that students can then step up and you know apply for. Um, and then we'll go through the matching project process to connect those existing the existing community members with the projects with those students. Uh, um, so if anybody here in the group is interested in that, if that seems like something this group is wanting to do, the application process is open right now. I think I think I sent a link to the list about that, but um, I'll double check to make sure. Yeah, you did actually, but I'm just dropping it right into the chat right there. So there's, there's the link again for anybody who thinks they're in a position to um, help somebody grow vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their, their technical expertise. So I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, as you can tell, I rattle through the bureaucratic stuff as fast as possible. We still have a good two thirds of the get together left, which is, I think, a fine balance between me and everybody else. So I'd like to shut up and introduce the one person I forgot to introduce. Uh, so this is Philippe Richon, who is, uh, by strange coincidence, associated with the blockchain initiative at University College London, which is where I went for my BA and MA. So this isn't nepotism or favoritism in any way. I had no idea that initially Philippe had those connections, but he wanted to bring up the question of whether or not what we do on Hyperledger might have a potential to grow outside of Hyperledger as well. So Philippe. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, good evening for the other time zones. Uh, so I'm a policy engineer, uh, chronologically first, uh, dealing with copyright and media entertainment for the last 12 years, uh, which means that I'm dealing with policies uh, I did that uh, in America with the MMA. I did that in uh, Europe uh, with the different directive we have. And I'm currently uh, commissioned by the European Commission uh, to uh, run an initiative which is called Copyright and New Technologies. So that is my job as a policy engineer. Uh, I'm also a system engineer by trade, uh, working on a potential solution for a copyright register. And here I'm happy to see uh, colleagues, uh, Sebastian Post from ICC. Uh, we are working with ICC and also the colleague uh, from IBM. Uh, my little startup is an IBM partner. And interestingly, what we discuss with IBM is portability. So we'll come surely back to, to this. So uh, that's in a nutshell um, where I'm coming from. So do you want David, now that we should start with this uh, question about hyperledger, portability, etc. Oh, please, yeah. And then I think once uh, once we feel you've got some meaningful answers there, I'd like to open up the rest of the session to general discussion <laughs> regarding what people would like this group to become in general. So uh, what we have done, including uh, with the colleague from ICC, is that we have uh, created a minimum viable demonstrator of uh, our concept. So. We start with concept first, and then uh, we demonstrate the concept. This is not yet a prototype. It's just before uh, the prototype. And uh, when we were doing so, we opted for a way which is, um, if you want, blockchain agnostic in the sense that uh, it can be developed uh, with Hyperledger, it can be developed with Ethereum, it can be developed with other blockchain protocols. So that was uh, a, a statement that we did when uh, we were developing this demonstrator. Uh, then I saw appearing uh, through uh, UCL Center for Blockchain Technologies, the invitation from David, and I saw that he was interested uh, in a domain which is very important for us, which is the uh, user experience, user interface in front of a copyright uh, register. So the basic idea is that people using a copyright uh, register should not be uh, gurus in intellectual property and should not have a PhD in blockchain. So that's the basic idea. And when I saw uh, David uh, invitation, I thought, ah, that's something interesting because we need something like this. So that was uh, my first reaction. My first reaction was then, of course, to join. Um, then the second one was uh, the question about Hyperledger in the sense that um, will this group be focused on Hyperledger 
or is this group uh, also focused on the functionality of, let's call it an intelligent metadata ingester that you need to place in front of any type of copyright register? Uh, and that is a fundamental question for us. Uh, we are in discussion uh, with European member states, so we discuss with uh, government, and you can imagine that for a government uh, to go in the idea of a national copyright infrastructure, that national copyright infrastructure has to be portable, cannot depend on one vendor or the next. Uh, interestingly, uh, this is a discussion that we have launched with, with IBM um, without even discussing about Hyperledger. So we are uh, now entering a new phase of discussion with IBM um, to really go deeply in what does it mean uh, to be portable with something like a copyright register and uh, what does it mean uh, to use a standard or to trigger uh, standardization. So that's the question we have. And uh, we would be happy, of course, and I would be happy to stay in the group, even if the group is purely hyperledger, because I'm sure that we, I will learn a lot uh, when it comes to the first invitation of David, which is about the UX UI interface with blockchain system. Where, uh, where you can imagine we are working for songwriters, we are working for photographers or journalists. Uh, they, they should not even know that blockchain is in the backyard of uh, the thing that they have on an app on your, their smartphone or on a laptop. So if we could just uh, open that up as a general question now, the first of several general questions. What about the issue of uh, portability? Does anybody have any advice or experience? And secondly, the issue of UX, UI, uh, and the same there. Does anybody have any advice or expertise they'd like to share? One, one question about the portability is, um, I know when we were looking at Hyperledger before, obviously there was the, the, the kind of the idea of a, of a private, you know, permissions ledger or public. Do you, do you, in terms of portability, do you have any thoughts on if you prefer to kind of compute in the cloud or whether these would be kind of uh, uh, private's the wrong word, but uh, you know, a, a private collection of servers or something like that for whether this would be open to everybody on, on a cloud? Well, Philippe, as somebody who's had experience on both sides, what would you recommend as a as a architectural decision? Uh, I cannot because, because for the moment we are scratching our heads. So we don't know, we are looking for the, the right solution. So uh, one of the first thing we have um, as an insight, if you want, uh, is that we make a distinction between the type of uh, uh, distributed ledger you need for a register, uh, which is dealing only with assertion and the type of distributed ledger that you need for uh, licensing, distributing, uh, payment, etc., which is focused on transaction. So this is, uh, this is the first distinction that we uh, developed. So uh, what we call assertion-oriented distributed ledger, uh, which is good enough for a register, and a transaction-oriented distributed ledger, uh, which, is, um, which is necessary uh, for licensing, distribution, and payment. Uh, what the, the next question, of course, is um, permission, permissionless, etc. cetera. Um, that is a question that we did not yet solve, even for the register. So uh, we, we are thinking about different uh, properties that the register must have. Uh, typically, um, the fact that it has to deal with uh, different policies. Uh, the policies might be uh, different from one country to the next. Uh, I mean, the policies for attestation uh, and the policies might be uh, different from one sector to the next, uh, typically between photography and music. Um, so the status of our thinking is currently in our white paper, which is uh, uh, public. Um, we are entering very soon, uh, probably within a month now, uh, a new phase 
uh, of development, and that's aiming to uh, develop a prototype. Uh, the prototype uh, as a deadline of the end of June, uh, and while we are making the prototype, which might be something that we will throw to the bin, right? It's we prototype to advance our research and development. While we do that, uh, we will uh, go much further uh, on paper uh, about the question of uh, platforms. And uh, in the what we call platforms include uh, the blockchain protocol. So that, that is uh, one set of statements. So you see we are we are wondering, we are not the one with uh, the statement, we are more the one with the questions. Uh, what we are, what we have also done also with ISCC uh, is that uh, we submitted uh, two uh, proposal for something which is called here in Europe, the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure. Uh, the European Commission is uh, ordering uh, uh, a European blockchain service infrastructure, which is an infrastructure, but they ask the consortium bidding for it to prove that that infrastructure uh, will tick some boxes of scalability, security, uh, resistance to uh, quantum attacks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and in the use case that they prescribe uh, to prove that, uh, they they kept all use case. So they said to the consortium, well, if you want to prove that your infrastructure makes sense and tick all those boxes, um, you can use uh, either uh, the use case of the copyright infrastructure or a use case of circular economy, uh, more in the direction of supply chain and green deal, etc. So with ICC, uh, we have uh, offered uh, to two consortia, uh, the possibility to use our uh, prototype to test the uh, blockchain infrastructure. So all of this to tell you, we are still wondering, we are still absolutely in a phase of uh, research and development. Uh, you can call it research development and innovation. That's how they call it in Europe. Uh, and we have many questions. That explain, of course, why I'm so keen to join this group. Uh, because I can find element of answers. Does that help as an answer? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Okay, cool. So I think maybe the, if there's no um, uh, general debate or discussion or disagreement even in, sorry, I've got a dog right beside me, on, on the issue at the moment, I think what I should do is sit down to, together with Philippe and we'll come up with something resembling an initial statement vis-a-vis -vis portability and I'll include it on the project proposal and then if over time it proves not to be the wisest approach we can always change it but I think it's something that I should formulate as, as soon as I can. Sebastian you're, you've popped up did you want to say something? Uh, just to add to what um, Philippe mentioned <clears throat> to distinguish uh, the different uh, purposes for different uh, ledgers uh, like uh, uh, Philippe men mentioned uh, some kind of a registration ledger um, and a transaction ledger, and um, uh, I, I thought I, I would like to add the the um, identity ledger uh, because that is probably something where Hyperledger is the most um, uh, advanced and and set um, uh, uh, ledger at this moment. As, as far as I overview a, a bit of a complex heterogeneous uh, um, um, uh, infra or environment um, regarding decentralized uh, uh, or self-sovereign identities um, because these um, self-sovereign identities uh, will be uh, used uh, probably as a use case quite uh, quite soon. Um, there are a lot of interesting projects uh, that are quite far ahead of um, in comparison to the media industries and uh, they will probably work on Hyperledger Indie or, or uh, other Hyperledger um, uh, uh, technologies. So uh, for me, it's especially interesting to see how that can, how that interoperability um, or uh, portability, uh, as you mentioned, could actually could actually work if we work with, uh, let's say, two or three uh, purposed, uh, different, uh, differently purposed um, ledgers. Um, and how, how they can interoperate, because that would uh, require, at least for a project um, or for all projects, uh, uh, a feature which would be to uh, uh, to work with um, at least 
um, open um, uh, uh, ledgers in the sense that they can be read. Uh, maybe they are permissioned uh, in the sense uh, regarding who can who may write and put uh, provide information uh, on the on these ledgers. But in order to be interoperable, at least uh, they need to be uh, open, and that's also something that is uh, relevant for. Um, I think uh, uh, dealing and transacting media assets uh, through um, identifiers and related metadata and uh, li uh, licensing information that you somehow have the opportunity to access and, and discover uh, these metadata information. Thanks. This might be a good place for, for John to jump in. John, did you want to come on and tell us a bit more about the work that you've done at Pandora? Sure. Uh, let's, it's been a couple years now, so let's see what I can rem uh, do from memory here. Um, to let me turn the video. Here. <clears throat> so uh, I'll just give the super super high level. If you guys have questions, that might jog my memory. To be honest, um, uh, initially started as more of an internal kind of hack project, uh, and we rallied a team around it. Worked on it for a while. Have not worked on it recently, uh, but at the time we were interested in. Um, creating a permissioned ledger for uh, for rights for for uh, song rights and uh, in specifically our case our use case that we we're trying to um, uh, solve for was that uh, as a as a DSP um, at, and Pandora just like Spotify or Apple Music uh, we're delivered lots and lots of uh, um, albums. Um, uh, via DDEX all the time. And uh, the rights aren't always in sync with reality. Um, it's up to a major label, for example, to if they acquire a new catalog, to uh, the, the old owner needs to send a takedown um, request to a DSP. The new owner needs to re-deliver that catalog. Uh, and so sometimes these are out of sync. Uh, and a lot of times these are hand these uh, situations put a DSP like Pandora in the middle where uh, if the owners themselves, the rights owners do not, are not in sync with their deliveries, a DSP like Pandora may be uh, playing a song or an album uh, that has already switched hands. And so when we go to pay out that royalty, we may be paying the, uh, the party that no longer owns the the copyright or maybe it's not the copyright but the uh the, the license and uh so a dsp will always end up in the middle of this when the new rights owner says hey um you know we're not getting paid appropriately or the old owner says hey these these checks are mixed up uh and then an audit has to happen at the dsp level so ideally we were looking at a permission ledger to basically automate this process uh remove the DSP from the, um, the middle of the situation and allow uh, parties to share their permissions uh, to resolve those conflicts uh, between them. And that's basically what we set out to prototype. Um, and I don't know if we got to the official prototype phase, but we were using at the time a Hyperledger Composer because it was sort of a, a time limited exercise, wasn't fully budgeted. Uh, and I think we got to the point where we had a proof of concept where we, we said this could work. Um, we did not uh, attempt at scale. Um, we, this would be intended to be somewhat of a um, private ledger um, between <clears throat> uh, rights owners. Uh, but again, we didn't go too much farther than that. Pandora was then acquired by SiriusXM. And you can imagine that uh, we've had our hands full with lots of other internal projects for the last couple of years since then. So. Uh, the interest has never waned on my part, but uh, that's about where we left off at Pandora. Do we have questions for John? I had a quick question. Thank you so much, John, for the overview. Uh, when you were, did you actually make it through the, the, into a proof of concept at all? And were you able to test it out? So in our, context, we made it as far as 
having having imported uh, rights with theoretical partners, um, theoretical different owners, and being able to um, perform updates in which we could share the uh, history of the transactions per participant, um, which was our initial hypothesis, and we didn't go much further than that. We were, we were also running this all on local computers. We didn't uh, really do like formal deploys or anything like that. And I'm just curious, in that limited testing, did you find it was pretty painless or was it still pretty sticky? Um, so this was several years ago and I, I haven't uh, caught up with you know, the latest and greatest tech on Hyperledger. So uh, this may be a biased or an outdated um, perspective. Uh, we chose Hyperledger for a few reasons uh, over, you know, Ethereum or something like that. Uh, we thought Hyperledger, having a private ledger would give us, um, would, would sort of give us the situation that we could sell to the rest of the industry for buy-in, um, knowing their sensitivities and things like that. And so we actually found that it was quite pleasant to work with at the time. This was with Composer. Um, this is before it was originally discontinued. Uh, so, so again, I don't know what the, the current state of all those tools are. Um, and we probably would have gone with uh, like a Go implementation if we had actually been formally budgeted and uh, if we had the time. But we used Composer because it was kind of a proof of concept uh, hackathon environment. Um, and it worked. I mean, it was, it was cool. Um, uh, you know, being able to write some of those things in JavaScript um, yeah, it was accessible. It seemed to work. We had some questions, which we never got to, things about, you know, how could we scale the transactions? Um, at the time, there were some white papers uh, showing us that it theoretically would be possible to, to scale to 800 or 1,000 transactions a second. Um, we never tested any of that. This was strictly just a kind of one at a time um, situation. But it, it was functional. I mean, you know, we, we, we realized that if we we were ever budgeted and we put time to this, um, that this could be a reality. Thank you. So against that, against that backdrop, and as you say, Composer has sort of, to a large degree, faded away. What, two years later, would you think, what could and should this group do? What would you like to see it do? <sighs> I don't know. I, I don't know. They have the answer to that, to be honest. I haven't spent a lot of time even thinking about this uh, in the last year or so. I think the opportunity to join this group and uh, to get the wheels moving again um, is what I'm interested in. So I don't know that I have the answer to that right away. Um, again, my interest has never waned in this. Uh, I think at least two years ago, um, the the um, the blockers that we faced internally in Pandora were more of a budget and timing perspective, not necessarily an excitement. There were people that were excited about that. There were just other priorities. Um, there was always the challenge, at least two years ago, for a general blockchain solution of, um, and, oh, and by the way, we did present this to the DDEX uh, plenary. So we did actually present our work to uh, a larger DDEX um, consortium. Uh, and. I think that the feedback we got at the time uh, was just more of uh, why do we need trust? Why do we need enhanced trust in these transactions? We're a uh, we already trust each other. We already have to trust, you know, Sony already has to trust Warner, all these things. Um, obviously, I don't share that, uh, that opinion, but that's some of the feedback we got was, um, this seems like a workaround to something that we could already build with existing tools. Uh, of course, we can't. We, we couldn't build that with existing tools because uh, trust is not, in, in, you know, in, implicit, in, in explicit in those things. So, uh, I don't know that the industry group that we talked to fully understood the benefits of putting trust uh, into the system as opposed to. Uh, into personalities, <laughs> um, but I still think that there's a huge need for something like that. So I don't know that I can answer that question right now. I think that's part of what uh, I would like to um, 
get re-energized in by being part of this group and talking about it. And uh, I'm sure I'll have an opinion about that uh, soon, but I'm just now getting to think about it again. Great, that would be a, a reasonable point at which to bring in Greg because of his, his experience. But before we do that, I noticed that already uh, Philippe and Jerome, who's joined us from France, they both have their hands up. Maybe Jerome, seeing as you're the, the new voice, would you like to uh, make your point? Yeah, thank you. Just let me put the cam. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is really interesting. To I discovered the, the project uh, presented by uh, by John from uh, from Pandora. Uh, the key is that DDEX is really uh, uh, what makes uh, rights management work today in the music industry. It's a, uh, a set of um, uh, tens of protocols, six dictionaries uh, that uh, help uh, any actor uh, understand um, uh, uh, what is a, a, a track, uh, what is a, a publisher, and uh, make them interoperate so everybody can interoperate uh, thanks to DDEX. Uh, the question is, uh, how uh, can we create trust for a new entrant in the DDEX system? And I, 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 I share uh, um, a general opinion about uh, uh, the fact that uh, the big uh, companies which are already uh, involved in this uh, uh, mechanism of rights management uh, already trust each other. The question is more for smaller ones or new ones who don't trust each other yet. We need a, a solution uh, to create tr trust. So this is a real need. And uh, in the past, there were some... Um, uh, um, third party were uh, proposed to make trust. So there was a company which was called uh, Transparency Rights Management, uh, which was uh, counting uh, the number of plays on YouTube uh, and reporting these plays to a PRS for music in the UK. There was the same thing in France. Uh, uh, with uh, with uh, Daily Motion and SASM, the French copyright organization. So it was a third party. And uh, the, the question when uh, uh, blockchain technology uh, uh, came up was uh, how, to, how to dismiss these third parties. And it was a real, uh, a real uh, opportunity. So I have a question for, for, for John. Um, because you, you started uh, working at Pandora on a uh, uh, Hyperledger uh, fabric, if I understand correctly. Um, uh, uh, SASM PRS for music and um, the ASCAP, the American uh, Copyright Organization, uh, tried to, to, to save some um, identifiers uh, couples with the recording identifier and the copyright uh, uh, identifier in the IP ledger fabric. Did you discuss with them uh, about uh, interoperability uh, between uh, uh, streaming uh, platform and uh, copyright uh, organizations? Uh, no, we did not. <clears throat> we did not. Uh, our goals were not actually to interop with a PRO, at least at the time. This was strictly just to handle the rights management issue from a, um, a DSP perspective, DSP between a, a label or a rights owner perspective. Um, that's, that was the, the narrow niche that we looked at. Philippe, did you want to add to that? Uh, well, yes, and it's almost like uh, bridging uh, both John and Jerome, uh, because I was listening carefully to John and it reminded me uh, the IBM project with ASCA PRS and SASEM, uh, which is um, not running anymore. And um, uh, some entities have taken over uh, this ID and they are not uh, using blockchain to solve that problem. Um, so that's one statement, but I'm very keen to discuss this further. Um, the point is that uh, we dealt a little bit uh, with that issue of uh, reconciliation of ISRCs and ISWCs uh, after companies like Pandora or Spotify have streamed uh, one song or the other. And uh, at one moment, uh, it was around uh, June, July last year, uh, we started to discuss, uh, wow, instead of fixing the problem, so matching those um, uh, identifier post streaming, 
uh, could we do something to prevent the problem to arise? Uh, and uh, after many weeks of discussion, but uh, concluding uh, the discussion around October, November uh, last year, uh, we found a way uh, to prevent the problem but that way to prevent the problem is based on moral right, uh, which is uh, less used in America than it is in Europe. And the, the principal moral right is the obligation of attribution. Uh, so if we start to build uh, in data and data management, uh, something on the principle of moral right, uh, we can potentially uh, prevent the issue to occur. So um, I'm quite excited, I must say, by this first hour, uh, because there are uh, stuff I would like to discuss with everybody, but also in particular with John uh, and Pandora as uh, we continue to work on this. I will, I'm just giving a warning that I must leave in five minutes. <laughs> That's okay. Um, thanks very much. Sorry, that noise was this, that was Pitbull versus UPS. So I apologize for that. It was resolved peacefully. Um, next we have um, Philippe, you got a chance to speak. Um, Eric. Hi. You've, yeah, sorry. Uh, you've had your hand a few minutes, yeah. Right, right, sorry, I'm late. I it was just um, uh, following John's discussion and, and the question that comes up quite a lot is that we're, we're already working in a trusted ecosystem. How is this gonna change things? And I think the, the, the word that Philippe used is, and, and that I've seen is that it's more about reconciliation and it makes the reconciliation process uh, perhaps a little bit easier and automated more so than mm -hmm. trying to find bad actors and, and, and trust like that. So that was my only comment. Great. Uh, I mentioned earlier, oh, Heidi, your hand popped up. Yep. Oh, Heidi, that's a thumbs up. Excellent. Yes, I was just agreeing with you. I audience. did. Good, good, good. Uh, and don't forget that uh, David, I think he did already, he embedded the link to the recently created chat. Now, if, by the way, if the chat turns out to be a pain in the posterior and people don't like it, or they just, uh, they'd rather be happy with something like Slack, you know, that's obviously no problem at all. So. If the proposed uh, socialization space doesn't work for anybody, just give me a shout and we can change it in two minutes. Greg, I wanted to get your viewpoint because obviously you've got a lot of experience and especially in the wake of what John said, I wanted to hear what you thought this group or maybe could or should become. What should we be doing in your mind? Well, sure, thanks, uh, David. Um, I think at the moment uh, I, I'm kind of in a, uh an osmosis kind of sponge mode, uh, just really listening to everyone's thoughts um, and trying to gather um, a, a sense of uh, the direction that uh, folks want to go. Um, some some definitely useful uh, or interesting points for me will be digging into to DDEX, and I, I think that's what will hopefully be a good reference point of the current state, because I think that could be helpful to the group just to build kind of a, a baseline, understand what uh, the ecosystem looks like today vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, future state. Um, and I guess my thought from there just goes to it. it's a wide ecosystem. So it, it does seem like we'll have a decision point as to where within that ecosystem we, we focus um, to kind of put my just kind of solutioning head on. I mean, in, in terms of the life cycle, we've already touched on a few different areas. We have uh, anti-piracy, kind of the, the content identification itself, remuneration on the other end, uh, rights transfers, um, John just alluded to kind of basically the, the audit trail and um, the, the reconciliation that was mentioned. Um, and then within there, you have the network, all the different kind of participants that are involved, everyone from creators to rights holders to um, you know, DSP kind of con consumers. Um, so I think my thought at the moment is just trying to, my, myself is just getting a handle um, where within that we're, we're focusing. Um, and then the other question that seems to have surfaced a little bit is, or are we do we have kind of an implementation um, idea at this state, or is there kind of a stage of talking about or to potentially developing a, a standard? Because um, it seems like that there there might be a question there whether there's a especially when it gets to interoperability. I guess would be my um, my observation from kind of the technical level. Um, the question's been been raised. I think I know some of the hyperledger stacks um 
you know, early on kind of the Ethereum integration was, was a common request. I know most of the stacks at this point uh, will give you some sort of EVM integration. Um, and then Cactus is, is obviously kind of picking up traction. So that's, I guess I would just throw that out to the group. Um, that, that is something we can look at, uh, sp uh, particularly um, at that interoperability space. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll sort of, that's a bit of a ramble, but uh, just kind of my, my observations um, so far, Dave. How but I actually, <laughs> did, uh, the, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please. Uh, yeah, well, just uh, I had a, a note from from earlier, so looping back a bit, but we had mentioned the the client facing or sorry the the client the user interface um, question, which I, I think is a good one, um, and also from a, a technical perspective, I think um, I'm not sure that any of the projects as of yet have um, built in uh, built in clients per se or built in UI or UX. Um, but I believe the majority of them have common language SDK. So Fabric has a, has a node uh, SDK. You can build um, APIs fairly fairly easily. So we kind of, I think we're, we're covered up to that level in, in terms of development from a technical standpoint. But, uh, and how, to... uh, working with music, how did uh, Hyperledger prove, how did it prove itself to be? Was it a successful environment or um, did it have its problems? For um, we've uh, so speaking, particularly from some of the projects uh, that I've worked on in, uh, in a commercial corporate setting, um, we've dealt with rights in some tangential areas, not necessarily for music rights. Um, and I think one of the biggest implementation questions just is that uh, closed system versus open. Um, are you developing a standard and a definition for? what content is, what an actor is, what a transfer looks like, whether you're answering that question in a closed network of participants versus defining an open standard. That's, I guess, just my observation at this point is that that can, can be a bit of a fork in the road. So it might kind of behoove us to decide um, what our goal is, is there. That's actually a good, really, really good place to, to, to end um, because it is now 10 o'clock. Um, so Greg has ended almost with an invitation to add question statements, queries, and so on to what we've already done so far. So my proposal would be twofold, that as we wrap this up, one, could you please let me know what you would like this project to become? What would be most useful to you? What would be most useful to the general development of tools with which you're already working? And two, um, how does the initial proposal I've put up strike you? Is it something that is, it is, that is of worth or would you rather see something developed more along the, the lines of let's say Philippe's white paper? So just to reiterate that, what do you think we should be doing? And uh, should it take one of two forms, either a coding project or more of a textual theoretical statement? Uh, we know where to add materials, we know where the chat is, you know how to reach me, we know hopefully how to reach each other. Um, on that point, I'd just like to say thank you very much to everyone who's been with us. Two weeks from now, the next meeting will be the so-called Asian meeting, so that'll be in favour of our folks who live in Asia, so you're welcome to join that, but I doubt for those of you living in Europe that's going to be terribly, <laughs> terribly convenient. So thanks once again, and I hope to see you very soon, either on or offline. Bye for now. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Please do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye -bye.